Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Hey, everybody. My name is Colin Stewart. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Predictable Revenue. I'm joined by my co-host and co-founder, best-selling author, Aaron Ross. Today, our first guest is uh, was the first BDR of Pardot. And correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, Anthony, but you were also the first, was it first hire or first sales hire at Sales Loft? Both, first hire and first sales hire. Wow. Welcome to the, to the show, Anthony. Everybody, this is Anthony. This is, I should have checked before I started. This is Cardinal. Uh, mistake number one, uh, Anthony Zhang. That's correct. Yep. Cool. And Anthony's the head of sales development at Hall. And what really sparked this conversation, Anthony and Aaron go way back. Um, but Anthony and I were having a conversation about, I guess, sort of people that come to you for advice, and they they always seem to be making the same mistakes. And you've got a bit of a checklist that you're going to share with us, sort of a pre-flight checklist. Um, you know, in monopoly terms, do not pass go, do not collect $200 until you've checked off all these boxes. But uh, you, you want to add anything to add there, Anthony? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of the times uh, I hear people who get into the SDR leadership role and, and they kind of want to just hit the ground running, which is, you know, really admirable. But, you know, I've always believed in, you know, measure twice, cut once. And so, there's a lot of things that need to go on, you know, before you get started hiring an SDR and, you know, executing on a process before even establishing a process and, and really mapping it out and thinking it through. Mm -hmm. Yep. Amen. A couple of books about that. I think I might have read one. Right. So Anthony, for those that are listening on the podcast, um, we've got, if you're on, if you download this on iTunes, there should be a video version available. Anthony's got some slides. If you don't want to download the video version, uh, I'm going to drop the link to the slides, the Google slide deck, uh, in the show notes. So feel free, click in, check that out. Um, but Anthony, do you want to share your screen now? And uh, let's get started. Absolutely, happy to. Thanks, man. Perfect. So when when we were first having a conversation about this, the you mentioned there's a couple sort of core areas. You know, do you want to do you want to elaborate on what, what those are? Um, yeah. So uh, really, three core areas. Uh, every time I go into a uh, new organization or a new role where um, I need to build a process up, I, I I ask myself: Is it scalable? Is it measurable? And is it repeatable? Right. And so part of that, the first piece is, uh, as mentioned earlier, it's mapping everything out. And so it's having that process and those operations in place, um, your Salesforce operations, uh, your, your scripting, your processes within Salesforce, um, you know, what solutions are you going to use and really having, you know, your toolbox in place and ready before you start building. Right. And then once that happens, you really want to go and start to execute and figure out, okay, here are some of the things that I need to do. And here are some of the things that I expect my team to do. So uh, execution would be the next piece. And then finally, you know, analysis and iteration, right? So measure, 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 figure out, okay, what am I doing right? What hasn't been working? And then go and iterate on those items and figure out, okay, how can I improve on this? What are some areas that I can improve on? So the first piece is, you know, process and operations. Uh, you know, like I said before, you, you want to measure twice, cut once. Uh, and specifically within, you know, this uh, example, I'm going to use Salesforce CRM now. You know, plenty of other people use different CRMs, but the concept's still the same. It's first of all identifying what kind of fields I need within my CRM. This is really important because I need to understand how to measure the different activities that I have. It's also important to understand, you know, where those fields are supposed to go in order to track the different items. Is it, is it a call activity, email? You know, when I connect with somebody, how do I report on that? When I set a meeting as an STR, when I set even a qualified meeting that's held, where do all those different activities go so that I can build reports on it? It's really thinking forward and thinking ahead. And then also tracking out you know, when I do win an opportunity, how do I report that back to that SDR that set up the meeting, right? Um, 
also setting up fields to support your SDR. So your SDRs need absolute insight when they're in your CRM into who your ICP is, are they the right person to talk to? They need to see all this information or at least enter all that information into the CRM somewhere. So do those fields actually exist today? If you're, if you're just joining a team that's already existent or if you're starting a new team, you know, do those fields exist today to where I can actually put those notes, enter those fields, have visibility into my ICP. And then also when I'm passing those notes to my AE, I'm, I'm passing the baton, can the AE see that and then access that and conduct their demos efficiently and effectively? And then even forward looking over there is, can I pass those notes to my CSM team? And so that's all in the, the dictated by the fields that you're sort of built, baking into to Salesforce. Can you, can you give an example some that, some non-standard Salesforce, uh, fields that are non-standard Salesforce that you think are critical to, to add in the, in the early days? Yeah, I think one of the critical uh, fields that, you know, hasn't really been traditionally used a lot is um, an inbound versus outbound field. One of the things that we really want to measure today is was this meeting set through an inbound initiative where a lead just came in, raised their hand and said, yes, I want to see a demo. Or was it actually through an outbound initiative where we can start to prove the viability of our outbound team? Mm -hmm. So by setting this up, now we can say, okay, 60% of our meetings set and held and closed one were actually through an outbound initiative. Uh, so this is where we need to double down on and you really understanding where you need to double down on within your SDR team. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll throw in because I, I have seen this in, in fact, like a few days ago, another my client who was, um, you know, mixed inbound and outbound in the same dashboard. And, it, you know, it's, theoretically, it's simpler that way, but it actually confuses the metrics in terms of who's doing what and what, which appointments are coming from which program and, you know, what are our results from because it's different and you keep them separate. Exactly right. And then understanding who actually set the meeting, um, you know, giving credit where credit's due. Sometimes people don't change the lead owner, you know, and, and human error happens. But if you have fields and you have the, the validation rules in place to say, hey, congratulations, you set the meeting. Just make sure you fill in the field so we can put credit where credit's due. Um, I think that that tends to be overlooked. Um, and so rewarding the SDR that did set the meeting is is crucial as well. Well, also, because this is a bit of a, it's like, a, I think, two things that people miss. First, actually, I'm going to get out of the way in case anyone, like, if your prospecting needs to be done out of, if you're using Salesforce, out of accounts and contacts, not leads. All right, so just make sure everyone understands that because you have the one-to-many relationship. Um, but the other thing is if you're a leader, what happens is it's not just rewarding the right person, but, um, or if you're a manager, understand that, you know, executives make decisions saying, hey, how well is outbound doing? Should we invest more in this? How well is inbound doing? Should we invest more in this? And if, it, if you're not accurately updating, where did the deal come from? And actually really keeping the integrity with uh, checking to ensure that outbound deals were outbound, inbound, or inbound, the attribution's correct, then it makes it harder for a company to decide what's working and how to, where they should they invest or what should they fix. Probably the worst offense you can do is not double check that, um, it's that attribution mixing. And this is where the Salesforce becomes so important or whatever your system is becomes so important is, uh, be able to go back and check. Sometimes outbound prospectors will email companies and they don't email the prospector back. They, that person goes to the website and registers for something. Mm -hmm. So that's still an outbound deal. And sometimes, so it's just having that kind of audit process and clarity and using your system of record to ensure outbound gets credit just for outbound. It doesn't take credit for inbound. And in the same, so that there's there's clarity of the business for what's working, what's not. Exactly. And so it gets two, confusing those people. So the first two fields that you're adding in is basically an inbound outbound field, and uh, did I hear you correctly? An SDR field. Yep. So uh, an SDR field having the the SDRs uh, as somewhat of a pick list uh, yeah. is typically what we do, uh -huh. and selecting the SDR that set the meeting up. And so that, just like Aaron said, you know, it can go uh, attributed back to that SDR, even if they do come in maybe through a demo request, but you can see through the history that the outbound SDR has been reaching out and, you know, attempting to set a meeting. Yep. 
and that's on just, I know we're getting super nitty gritty. I'm just, I'm curious. And I know other people listening are curious. This is on the, on an activity you've created these two fields, right? Mm. No, it'd be on the, either on the account need some way to show, um, you know, who's working it and on the opportunity itself, opportunity field, need a SDR, BDR owner pick list of who that is. Yep. Exactly. Not on the, not on the activity itself. Yeah, so it would be within the objects. So it would be either within the contact or the opportunity or the account or even all three, right? So that's where you start to really think about the, the data that passes through your different objects. Mm -hmm. um, so what's important to understand after the deal's closed, how do we bring it all the way back to the beginning of when we first started reaching out? So hey, Anthony, so since we're talking about you know CRM, quick question, like where do you think people go wrong with tracking too much like how what does that look like because it's easy to do sometimes um, what are the signals that you're trying to track too many things and overcomplicate it yeah I think when you're starting to repeat uh, the same actions um, that's when it becomes inefficient um, when you're doing the same thing within activities and tasks that you're doing within fields and you're marking um, the exact same things over and over that's when you start to build uh, inefficiencies. You're starting to, uh, I guess, overthink things a little bit. Um, I, I think that uh, if you do something within uh, the, the fields itself, then we should think about omitting that within the activity and vice versa. Yeah, because there's a cost. The more you track, you should get clearer information, but there's, at some point, uh, people just update less. There's like a mm -hmm. balancing act there. Great. So, so now that you've got your, you know, a couple of your base fields and you've got your sort of sales, minimum viable Salesforce model, mm -hmm. uh, data model sort of mapped out, what's, what's your next step there? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, what, uh, just kind of along the lines of tracking activities, it's, it's understanding um, the, the different uh, statuses, right? That's, that's a big thing as well, especially when it comes to visualization amongst the team. The larger the team, obviously, the, the more room there is for error, uh, the more people tend to step on each other's foot. And so having that visibility into where that contact is uh, within the cycle, are they being worked? Uh, you know, have they been worked? Are they in a nurturing program? Um, that, that status is super crucial um, in understanding exactly where that, that contact is within the cycle. Uh, so as one other question. And so when you think about you, when you may be in the current job, you're starting this process and you're thinking about the fields and, um, you know, it's a, it's takes time to get all this sort of figured out. Like, what do you think is a fair amount of time? Maybe it's on Salesforce or here we've got the Salesforce field, you know, telephony and email. Um, you're sort of like getting your, your apps configured and worked mm -hmm. out. I don't know. Do you think is that more, Days, weeks, months? Uh, I think 30 days should be enough. Um, you know, you spend a couple days planning and then uh, implementing, syncing up the tools together. So whether it's a telephony or an email tool or, or a combination of both, um, I think they all go hand in hand uh, because you, you definitely want to find, uh, and I guess this jumps to the next bullet, um, where you definitely want to find a telephony and email solution that can sync with your CRM, whatever that CRM may be. May be. Uh, just to, again, eliminate some of the manual tasks that the SDR has to perform and execute on because you've got to think about it. The more that they're within their CRM and the more they're sort of uh, running operations, as it were, uh, the less time they're on the phones, right? The less time they're sending emails, the less time they're in front of their prospects. And so being able to find a solution that really syncs up all three and talks to each other and then tracks those activities automatically within your CRM allows your SDR to focus less on the operations and more on the execution. Okay, so, so next step, Anthony, is uh, basically lead gen and data sources. So what, what are you looking for here? and What's, what's important to you? For the this, yeah, I, I think this is one of the, the biggest challenges and biggest hurdles of uh, most SDR teams uh, today. Uh, you have so many different sources where uh, you can gather email and phone number from and different processes. And so it's understanding, uh, you know, where you are uh, in terms of your ICP and what kind of data sources you really need. And if 
you're okay with just getting one solution or, or multiple solutions. Some teams, you know, have a really powerful marketing team where they already have kind of all that data in front of them, whereas okay. other others are, you know, pretty barren. And so they need to go out and do their own prospecting. And, you know, as a sales or an SDR leader, it's, it's really your goal and your job to say, okay, how can I tee up my SDR team for success and provide all these leads for them or at least kind of give them that uh, initial boost, right, to uh, allow them to begin their process of calling and emailing. Variety of sources there. You probably don't need, that's probably uh, enough, uh, it, enough of a topic we could, we could spend uh, a whole episode or more on. Absolutely. You could do a whole podcast on it. I mean, like a series. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It takes, seems like anything else takes time to, fit, to get your strategy and data down. I think it's, it's easier to build it than it is to manage it, mm -hmm. clean it as you, as you have it. Yeah, keep it clean. So, so yeah, then, is it elegant? Yeah, so, you know, the, the very last thing is, you know, after you have all these different items sort of ironed out, you got to ask yourself, is it elegant? Um, you know, one of the things that... Uh, you know, Aaron alluded to is that you can certainly get trapped and caught up in uh, doing the same thing within your, your CRM or your sales force um, to where they, the, the SDRs choose not to do it instead because it's just a waste of time. And so um, actually one of the core values here at, at Hull is, you know, seek elegant solutions. Is it the best solution? Is it the most streamlined solution? And so, like we said before, you know, more time they spend in their CRM, um, running operations, the less time they're on the phones, the less time they're you know, sending emails and in front of the prospects. And so ask yourself, you know, is anything, uh, you know, can we automate anything? Can we streamline anything? Uh, you know, and, and did we leave any room for error? Are there validation rules in place to where we can sort of put guardrails um, around our team? And, and the sort of measure of this is how quickly an SDR can come in. Is that from day one and execute? Uh, yeah, so the, the fa uh, you have onboarding, you have your traditional onboarding, uh, you know, coaching them on the, the culture of the company um, and the process, but uh, ultimately you want to, through this, through this initiative, you really want to create a cookie cutter process to where, you know, after the initial training is done, they come in and they're just able to execute step by step, step A, B, C, D, um, and, you know, hit the ground running. Awesome. Yep. So once you've got your sort of your cookie cutter bill, what's, what's next? So the, the next piece is really execution. I want to touch on this just briefly because, uh, you know, again, it's, it's the first thing I want to touch on is theory versus practice. It's uh, as an SDR leader, you know, you want to come in and you really want to be able to execute on your own methodologies, right? Because if you don't know how to do it, you can't really expect an SDR to come in and, and figure it out themselves. So it's you kind of going into the trenches and being able to uh, make those dials, send those emails. Uh, you know, I, I made a note there of, you know, actually getting hung up on, you know, and taking, taking notes on the common objections because what you're, you're doing through this execution process is you're setting your team up for success and you're also preparing them for the worst. And that's the best thing that you can do as an SDR leader is to actually be within those trenches because ultimately you're building trust amongst your team. You're saying, Hey, I was there. I've heard this, this, and this be prepared for these objections. Right. So you're saying is don't just manage, actually do the prospecting as well. So you know how it works, what's realistic and how to better coach and train people because you've been in the trenches, but how long, you know, indefinitely, or they do it until it's working the first few months on um, I think, I think you do it until, uh, you, it, it's, it becomes hard to balance, uh, between a, uh, player coach versus a manager, right? So if you can player coach, continue to do that. But once your team starts to grow and scale, then start to scale back. Cause ultimately you want to focus more on your team, on the training, on the one-on-ones rather than the actual process itself. When, when is the right time to scale back? Like, how do you, how do you know? Uh, typically, uh, you know, it just depends. It's typically, I would say about once you get to a, a four or five SDRs, then it's, it, it might be time to start to scale back a little bit and, uh, focus more on the, the one-on-ones and the training and the call, call recordings. Gotcha. So once you've got your the execution nailed, like what's, what's up next? What's the next big step here? 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, measure, measure, measure that's and iterate, you know, so once you get through sort of the, the design of things and the implementation of things, then it's just kind of taking a look back, um, and saying, okay, what worked, what didn't work, what's going well. Um, obviously you can use dashboards reports for that to measure and track activity. Um, and to really see, okay, where are some of the hurdles that we're experiencing? If I, I like this, uh, your weekly call review that, you know, pick out one good call, a bad call and a miscellaneous call. Yep. Like That's a nice uh, way to cover the, cover the ups and downs and wild card. Yep. Absolutely. And that's really where, and I did separate intentionally separate a weekly one-on-one -on -one with a weekly call review. Uh, one of the things that my old managers did really well was they said, Hey, the one-on-one -on -one is your time, right? This is where you get to tell me where your issues are, where, where your roadblocks are and challenges are. And this is where you ask me for help and guidance and give me one thing that I can help you with this week because uh, you know, an SDR leader can get certainly inundated with a million requests. And so give me one thing this week that I can help you with. The weekly call review is actually separate to say, okay, now I want to focus on you. Now it's my turn to kind of take stuff from you and see where I can help you as a manager. So assuming you've got all of your Salesforce dashboards or all your, your data model set up correctly, you've got everything. This, this next step, I think this is the one, one area where I think a lot of people get stuck and it's probably because they skipped that first step of you didn't think through the, you haven't thought through the model, you're not collecting the right data. And, and I guess if you're like, your, your goal is to make it a cookie cutter, you're measuring the same thing for every rep. Every rep is, is following the same process. They're tracking their calls in the same way. They're getting their contacts and accounts in the same way. This actually must become quite, I don't want to say easy, but less uh, uh, Excel jujitsu. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it does, it does become a formula after a while where you understand to implement step A before B before C. The, the worst thing that you can do is try to begin executing and calling and emailing and, and hiring uh, before you have your CRM system set up because after a couple months, uh, you're gonna find yourselves backtracking, oh, we need this field and we, we forgot this field. And so then you have to start working backwards. Some people actually have to scrap their entire Salesforce or their entire CRM and start from scratch again. Mm -hmm. And so again, the planning phase is super crucial. And so what are some indicators that, you know, it might be, it might be time to go back and, and have a look, like maybe we missed a step. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's exactly where the analysis and iteration uh, step comes in is as you're measuring, as you're looking at all these reports, you know, one of the things that, you know, we forgot uh, to do here was that inbound versus outbound, uh, you know, field. And so I actually, luckily it we caught it very soon because we went through this pretty quickly. Um, but I had to go back and fix about 60 records to uh, assign, you know, that they were, they were through inbound or they were through outbound. Um, and so imagine having hundreds and hundreds of records where you have to do that and, and kind of track historic data. Uh, so it, it's definitely something to, to be aware of as you're designing this, this process and this framework. Cool. So, so what's up next here, Anthony? Uh, yeah. So, you know, once you have the, the process streamlined, it's scalable, repeatable, measurable. Uh, you know, the, the next logical thing is just to start scaling your team. Uh, so hiring is kind of the, the big piece. Uh, you know, hiring is, is kind of interesting because you're, you want to balance who someone is skill wise versus personality wise versus experience. Um, and it, it's kind of an interesting play because, you know, I've seen rock stars just come out of the trenches, hungry from college, just ready to hit the phones. And then some other uh, who are, who are just fresh out of college also that, you know, decided, Hey, this cold calling thing isn't for me. Right. And so you want to be, weary of that you want to set expectations in the beginning uh, you know uh, find, try to find roles where they have been hungry in the past and they have really fought for uh you know the, uh, in a competitive role fought for the top right the, the, the top rung of the leaderboard um, whatever it is uh, i typically go after candidates that have 
roughly about nine months experience, six months experience, maybe, maybe 12 months experience, because you have to understand that some of these more senior seasoned SDRs, they're, they're gunning for an A role. That's just the natural transition that SDRs have is they want to be a closer in AE. And so if you get them too late in the game, they're already ready to move up. They said, nope, you know, I, I did my time as an SDR. I'm ready to be an AE now. Uh, so you kind of want to get them in that sweet spot. Thank you. Do you hire, so do a lot of... We've heard this on the call is that if you're an SDR, that sort of, that first job that you take, that first role is pretty critical for you to, to, to get that bump from SDR to, uh, to AE. So sorry, you're hiring, or a lot of people you like to hire, they've got previous experience in process, as an SDR? I do. I, I like to hire those that have had some type of uh, SDR experience or experience working with you know, uh, uh, customers outside. I mean, I've, I've hired people that worked in retail before, um, but being able to engage yeah. with different uh, individuals is, is important. Um, That's where, because there's sort of this trick, you know, I think hiring people with, you know, related skills, but there's this, uh, it's not a bit of a paradox, but in the SDR role, you sort of do it for, you know, if you include inbound and outbound, but, you know, it's called all that, the SDR role together is, um, you know, uh, eight month to two year mm -hmm. uh, window. It's like, if you do it longer than that, there's probably something wrong. If you're, um, so to catch someone, so the people who cut that short and so you're actually hireable either it seemed like you have to find the right, like bad company, a good person, a bad company. Cause mm -hmm. otherwise you're going to stay. It's just, I think it'd be hard to find people with like six to nine months of SDR experience who are good because they either have to be bad because they had to leave or, <laughs> They're good, but the company's bad and it didn't work out. So I, it's like a needle in a haystack. I'd, but I do, uh, if you've done it, great. But uh, I totally agree with people who've done something similar, like I said, retail sales or places where they've shown initiative of, you know, able to, um, in public relations, uh, recruiting. You know, there's lots of types of jobs and situations people have done salesy or SDR types of roles or activities to have showed they've got the, the interest and aptitude for it. Yep, yep. The, the, the biggest thing to look out for is just to make sure that they are aware of sort of the role and, and truth be told, it can be a monotonous job. You're cold calling every single day. You're, you're kind of dialing for dollars. Um, and so that's, that's definitely something that takes uh, a certain amount of tenacity. Um, so that, I mean, if, if that's a quality that, that we want to look for, then, you know, by all means, find that person that has that tenacity that, that has shown that within previous roles or previous organizations um, and, and kind of make that uh, your number one goal. Great. Yep. So, so what are some red flags uh, that you should look out for or that you look out for? Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that actually came across uh, someone asked me about this is, Hey, you know, we just hired, uh, someone they're just fresh out of college they're you know super eager uh, but you know they just don't have the experience and without that experience and and then also without the process in place um, we're basically setting that person up for failure and so just be careful that just because they're eager and again we mentioned tenacious and you know right hungry and ready to be on the phones um, you know, if they don't have proper guidance, that's, that's definitely something that we can stumble and trip, uh, trip over. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of be aware of that. They're not every single, you know, entry level person that's, that's hungry like that is going to be a rock star. And we, we need to make sure that we set them up for success. Yeah, because, you know, they could be hungry, but they need, still need a lot of support if they're right out of college. Mm -hmm. They don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Unless they did something similar as interns and for. Yep. And just like Aaron, uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, if they are uh, two seasoned, uh, they do have that expectation of moving up sooner rather than later, in which case, then you have to think about backfilling that person and training them again. Um, so it just becomes a repetitive cycle and you won't really want them in for a, a decent amount of time, uh, you know, 
nine months to, to maybe 13 or 14 months. Yeah. Or they, uh, their ego is too big for it. Cause it's like people, if they've closed too much, um, I mean, you can bring a closed room from in like another industry sometimes because if it's still a career progression, but if they've closed deals and they feel and they're just doing this to get in, then the whole time they usually, again, there's exceptions, but usually it's, they're just not that good because they don't really want to do the job. They're just, oh, I got to do this, but I really should be, you know, be promoted already. Mm -hmm. it's, it's doesn't, it's rare that it works well. Right. And, but that should not be your default. So moving on to yeah. a last sort of section here, what's the, what are some common mistakes and challenges that you see companies running into? Yeah. You know, the, the, the very first thing is they just immediately want to scale their team. Um, they think that, you know, numbers equal success and the, the more SDRs we have, the more successful we'll be, which just simply isn't the case, right? Again, if you, if you don't have step A, step B, step C in place where you're ready to hire an SDR, then, you're just setting all those different individuals up for failure. So that's, that's the number one mistake that I hear all the time is, you know, we want to hire an SDR or we, we want to grow the SDR team so we can grow the, the call volume and the meeting set volume. But uh, again, if they don't have the proper training, if they don't have the proper framework set up uh, around them to allow them to succeed, that's where we trip and fall. Um, you know, and then, Again, we mentioned uh, earlier on theory versus practice and leading as a manager versus leading as a sort of a player coach. Uh, you know, having that experience, knowing where uh, some of the, the challenges are, some of the objections, uh, understanding that, that certain workflows just aren't as efficient and going back and fixing those. So that's, that's another thing because you can, you can tell someone all day long, well, you know, this is how I would have handled that objection versus this is how I handled it when I was calling, right? Um, I put, I put, I wrote in not investing in your SDR's bank account. Now, <laughs> uh, coming from sales, we, we all think that this is a monetary bank account, but it's actually a, a morale and emotional bank account. Um, you know, it's, it's supporting them. It's being there for them. It's having those weekly one-on-ones, uh, which isn't just about their performance, but about, uh, you know, how they're feeling, what's going on with them, you know, what are some of their challenges and roadblocks and really being there as a leader and as a, a mentor and someone who can support them versus, you know, just a manager, right? So really investing in your SDR's bank account is incredibly important. And then when you do have to, sometimes you do have to reprimand and then you just kind of make a, a small withdrawal out of that bank account, but ultimately that bank account should be in a positive uh, place. And then finally making your SDR's figure it out. Um, that's, that's the worst thing you can possibly do is, <laughs> um, you know, if you don't have that process in place and you expect your SDRs to figure it out, that's, that drives that, that more all down, uh, more than anything. It's funny, the number, I, I mean, your, your first quote there, you know, we're not sure if we're ready for this yet, but we, we just hired our first SDR is, is the people, is, I think the, the hardest situation to be in for an SDR has got to be a company that's only half committed. It says, we just want to try something. Because then, you well, plus we expect you to get twenty appointments in the next thirty days. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, one of the things that I heard, uh, you know, at uh, one of my older companies is, you know, as, as soon as I came in, uh, you know, it was it, it was investing in that bank account, right? And it was uh, scheduling team outings. Um, it was team training sessions every week. Uh, you know, on different sales topics, uh, you know, watching different sales videos, listening to calls as a group. Um, so it's, it's doing all those things um, to really invest in, in your SDR team, because a lot of, a lot of organizations, they don't invest in their team. They just hire their SDRs and expect them to perform. And that's just not the case. That's great, man. hundred percent. It's the worst to be oh. that sort of orphaned SDR in your yeah. without any support. Uh, Last question is, you know, too many SDRs at the beginning is a mess. Like, what do you think is a good number? If someone has said, hey, we, we want to do this, like, how do I hire one, two, three, four? I, I, I think two to three is always a good number, just depending on how confident you are with your process and your framework. Um, I think two to three uh, creates uh, some competition, some friendly competition. 
of, you know, how quickly can we learn this material? How quickly can we get on the phones? Who's going to be the first one to set the meeting, right? It gets pretty exciting um, when you start to see uh, the, the kind of the wheels turning within the SDR machine, uh, you know, because they, they, they really are eager to perform. Um, they are eager to get on the phones. And if you have just one person by themselves on the phone, if you just hire one person, it can be a, a little intimidating. But if you have you know, two or three people all on the phones together, that energy that, that kind of pushes each other to, to continue to, to kind of be better. Anthony, last call or last uh, question here. Who, who do you hire first? Do you hire the, uh, the chicken or the egg or the SDR manager or the, the SDR? Um, you know, I, I, I think you, you hire the SDR with management potential. I, I think that's the SDR that you hire. You, you hire the SDR that has that leadership potential. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a manager, um, but they have that leadership potential to where uh, as you hire more SDRs, they become the player coaches, right? That allows you to then focus on more uh, sort of management aspects, training aspects, um, while they're still performing, executing, and setting an example for the other SDRs. So that's, that's, the, that's the kind of the unicorn SDR, as I would call it. Yeah. That's great, Anthony. I want to, want to thank, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, this has been super valuable. I feel like I learned a lot, um, and I love the, the sort of checklist format of how you've got, you know, tick off these boxes, do not move on to the next one until you've nailed these. I, th I think that's something that uh, probably would have saved me a ton of time uh, building my first team. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Aaron, Colin, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank, thank you. And Great. People, people that are listening, um, have a look at the show notes. We've got a link to uh, the slides in there and uh, we might even have a couple surprise images for you. Uh, so check those out and uh, <laughs> look forward to seeing you on the next call. Safe for work, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs>